Way back in the 1960s, a paragraph in a newspaper attracted my attention. It was called The Shirt and told of what was believed to be a true story. I was so intrigued by the implications of that story that my imagination got to work and I started writing. The result was a script for a play which I submitted to the BBC. They rejected it, presumably because they thought it rather sentimental. So I'm trying it out on you in the belief that you are sentimental enough and patient enough to listen. Originally it was written to be performed by several characters but I've had to rearrange it as a narrative. I want you to imagine the days of depression after the First World War and imagine a street of very small terraced houses with no front gardens. There's the house of Mrs. Rogers. The door of the living room opened directly onto the street. Through the window one could survey the houses on the other side. Times were hard. It was a shabby but well-kept living room. There will be several brief musical interludes to indicate lapses of time. Mrs. Rogers is counting some money which she kept in a cup. Sally, who lives opposite, appears at the window, taps, smiles, and then enters through the front door carrying a shopping bag. Here you are Mrs. Rogers, she says, and begins to unpack the contents of the bag onto the table. Stewing beef, margarine, sugar, flour, eggs, rice, potatoes, and a tin of sardines. That's what you wanted. And what do you think of this material I got for one elephants? I'm going to make Dad a shirt with it. Mrs. Rogers fingers the material. That's very nice, Sally. Good strong stuff. Should last well. Oh dear, it's about time Bert had another shirt. He's only got one decent one now. I've been patching the rest for months. Oh, you can have this material if you like offered Sally. I can go along and get some more tomorrow. They've got plenty at the shop. Thanks Sally, said Mrs. Rogers. But we can't manage it while he's got no job. She hesitates as she fingers the material again. No, his shirt must wait. What do I owe you for the shopping? Three and sevenpence, said Sally. Just a minute, said Mrs. Rogers, and I'll get it for you. She moved to the money on the table. No, I'd better not use this. It's the coal money, and we're almost out. If I break into this, we'll have no fires, and then Bert will have something to say. Three and sevenpence, did you say, my dear? I'll get it from the other room. And so she leaves the room by a door on the left. Sally looks at photographs on the mantelpiece, the small fire, the coal money, the furniture, and she sighs and turns to the window, and she remains there till Mrs. Rogers returns. Here you are, my dear, said Mrs. Rogers, three and sevenpence. Now I'm out of debt. Good gracious, look at the time. But will be in any minute and no meal ready. I must get those potatoes on quick. Where's Bert now? asked Sally. Oh, I don't know where he gets to half the time. Out with some of his pals, I expect. Ron Padwick's home for three days. 
his ship came in on Tuesday. He's off again tomorrow morning, so I expect that's where Bert is. They were great pals from school days always, always together in everything. Bert missed Ron when he went to sea. I sometimes wonder if that is why he could never settle down. He seemed so moody at times after Ron had gone. They'd always been together till Ron went to sea. Well, Bert was sort of lost. He's not a bad boy, really. Things just haven't gone his way, that's all, since the factory closed down. There's no work around. Cheer up, Mrs. Rogers, said Sally. Sooner or later things are going to be all right and you'll be proud of him. You know how I like Bert. Have done ever since I was a little girl when we used to play in the street together. He's got a lot of good in him, I know. It's bound to come out one of these days and then everything will be all right. Mrs. Rogers sighed. I hope so, Sally. But you can't live on dreams. Like this insurance policy, and she picked up an envelope. There was this man who called yesterday. He tried to persuade Bert to take out a life policy. But what's the use of a thousand pounds when you're dead? And while you're on the dole, you can't afford the payments. Oh, the man said you could pay outright, but... and. Bert was real keen to do something about it, but I told him there was no money to spare. Well, I'd better get on with the cooking. And I must get some of my jobs done, said Sally, and she picked up her basket. Goodbye for now. And she left through the front door. Mrs. Rogers watched her through the window, crossing the road, and entering the house opposite. And she called after her, Thanks for getting the shopping for me. And she looked at the clock, which showed 6.15, and began to prepare the vegetables. As the daylight fades, she tidied the room and dealt with a pile of mending and prepared the table for a meal. Anxiously, she waits for her son to return and at intervals go to the door to gaze down the street. The meal cooked, she put it on the side of the stove to keep warm. Continually looking at the clock, she picks up a pile of socks and begins darning. Wherever can he have got to, she mutters. Eight o'clock, nine o'clock, ten o'clock goes by. Till at last, at ten twenty, she hears the sound of singing, drawing nearer. Finally, Bert enters, obviously far from sober. Wherever have you been to all this time? asks Mrs. Rogers. Your dinner's been ready for hours. Besides, you're drunk. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. A man out of work cannot afford to drink. It's as much as I can do to make ends meet and keep the place decent. And you go and disgrace me like this. Sorry, Mum, said Bert. Nothing more to worry about now, Mum. Everything is going to be all right. I've got a surprise for you. I've got a job. You've got a job? Yes, I've got a job. Nothing to worry about anymore. Nobody will be able to say that I'm a burden to you. Oh, I'm glad to hear it, but, but what's the job? I'm going with Ron. I'm going to be a sailor. I'm going to sail the seas with Ron Padwick to see the wonders of the world. What do you think of that? Mrs. Rogers was obviously shaken. No, Bert, 
You're not going to leave home and leave me alone. So I'm to be a sailor, like Ron. But you might have talked about it with me before this. Oh, Bert, the drink has got to your head and you don't know what you're doing. Have some of the stew and go to bed. Your mind will be clearer after you've had some sleep. You might change your mind in the morning. Nope. Mind's made up. Final. Boat sails tomorrow. Got to leave at ten. At ten? But you can't. You've got no decent clothes to go away in. You've not got a spare shirt to take with you. That's all right. Who cares about a shirt when you're at sea? Oh, it's no good talking to you when you've got drink in you. You're just like your father was. Get on with your supper. And she pours the stew into the dish and puts it on the table. Come on, get it eaten. <sighs> well, if your mind's made up, then at least I'll see that you go away decent. She looks out of the window. Sally's only just going to bed. And she takes the coal money from the cup, goes out through the street door, walks across the road. Sally opens the door wearing a dressing gown. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Rogers, whatever is the matter. I'm sorry, my dear, said Mrs. Rogers, to fetch you down so late, but I wonder if you'd do me a favour. Oh, of course, said Sally. What is it? That shirt material you bought, could you let me have it? Of course you can have it, Mrs. Rogers, but why the hurry? Bert has just come home, and he said he's going to see... He's going at ten in the morning. The shops won't be open, and I want him to go away decent. Oh no, said Sally. Surely he's not going to leave you suddenly like that. Seems his mind is set on going. I can't stop him, Sally, if he means to go. I want to do the best for him I can. All right, Mrs. Rogers, of course you can have the material. It's still on the side table where I left it. And she moved into the house and quickly returns with the package. Here it is. One and eleven pence, did you say it was? That's right, one and eleven pence. We don't have to pay now. Oh, yes. You know, I don't like being in debt. I'd rather pay now and have done with it. Here you are. One shilling and sixpence, and one, two, three, four, five, that makes one and eleven. Can I help at all? asked Sally. Shall I come and have a word with Bert? Would that help? No. Thanks all the same, my dear. It's too late now. You get some sleep. I'll manage. Good night, my dear, and thanks. And when Mrs. Rogers return to her house, she finds that Bert has fallen asleep. She shakes and Come on, off to bed with you. There's work to do. She sees him to the door and clears the table. Then she takes one of Bert's old shirts and a pile of newspaper. And from the old shirt, she makes a pattern with the newspaper. And methodically, piece by piece, she takes the new material and with the guidance of the newspaper pattern she has made, she carefully cuts the cloth. It is exacting work. And the hours go by as she works far into the night, piece by piece and stitch by stitch, the new shirt begins to emerge. Her eyes become heavy, but she perseveres with her exacting work. Two o'clock, three o'clock strikes. 
Still she continues her act of love till at last when it's nearly four o'clock the garment is finished. She heats her flat iron and presses her handiwork. Carefully folded, she places it on the sideboard, wearily collapses into an armchair and is instantly asleep. Some three hours later she suddenly awakes, sees the daylight streaming through the window and realises how late it is. Making a pot of tea, she hastily climbs the stairs to Bert's bedroom. Time to get up, Bert. It's gone seven. By the time Bert has dressed, his breakfast is ready for him on the living room table. Where's the boat going to, son? asked Mrs. Rogers. Oh, can't tell for sure, said Bert. It's on loan to an American firm. American firm it expects it will pick up cargoes wherever it can. And how long before you come home, asked Mrs. Rogers. Oh, can't tell that for sure either. Two or three months, perhaps. And you're still set on going, son? Oh, why, yes, of course. It'll be sort of interesting to see the world, all the places you see pictures of in books. And it's a healthy life, Mum. And I'll be with Ron. You know I've missed him all this time. And what about Sally? asked Mrs. Rogers. She's going to miss you. Bert remained silent. And what about me? Oh, you'll be all right, Mum. Sally will look after you. She's always been like a daughter to you since Dad died. You've always said so. But you've never been away from home before. I've always done my best for you. You're going to be in strange surroundings. The sea's a hard life, son. You're going to have to put up with lots of things that you're not used to. I want you to stay decent. I want you to come back the same as you go away so that I can be proud of you. Don't let anyone lead you to anything you wouldn't want me to know about. Stay good, son. There's enough bad in the world already. Be a credit to me. Here, take this with you. And she hands him the shirt. It's the best I can do. But, Mum, said Bert, if you give me more time, give me more time, I'd have given you a better shirt. But, well, no one can do more than their best, and only the best is good enough. Always remember that, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. There's a knock at the door. Mrs. Rogers opens it to admit Sally. Oh, it's you, Sally. Yes, it's me. I wonder if Bert would like to have this case to put his things in, and she offers a suitcase. I don't really need it myself. Oh, thanks, Sally, said Bert, but I hadn't thought much about packing. But do sailors have suitcases? Of course they do, said Mrs. Rogers. It's just what you need, and it's very kind of Sally to think of it. Now I must get the rest of your things together. And she goes out of the room. Bert stands somewhat shyly and unsure of himself. Sally walks across to him, places her hands on his shoulders and lightly kisses him. Bert suddenly loses his reserve. Oh, Sally, I'm sorry. I never knew it would be as difficult as this. We're going to miss you, Bert, said Sally. And I'm going to miss you. I'm going to remember the times we had together. Do you remember, said Sally, the day we went to Richmond? Oh, yes. And you said that if you had a thousand pounds, you would buy a house by the park. <laughs> but laugh when my ship comes in. Yes, when your ship comes in. And now you're going off to seek your fortune. Perhaps one day your dreams will come true. Yes, said Burton. One day I'll buy you that house by the park. I didn't sleep all night, said Sally, thinking about you going. 
it's all so sudden. Your mother's going to be lonely, Bert. It's not going to be easy for her when you've gone. I know how you feel about going away, tired of doing nothing for so long, not wanting to be thought a burden, and I admire you for it, but your mother is going to feel it so. And she picks up the shirt. Just look at this. Yes, said Bert. Mum's just given it to me. Given it to you? Why, she must have stayed up all night to make it. Stayed up all night? Yes, she only had the material at eleven o'clock last night. It must have taken her hours and hours. Bert turns away and is silent for a while. Sally, I don't know much about last night. I had a few drinks, I know. Somehow I don't feel so good about going away as I did last night. I don't feel it's wrong to go, I don't mean that. It's just that, well, I don't want people to think that I'm running away. They won't think that, Bert, said Sally. I never was much good at expressing myself, said Bert. It isn't running away exactly, it's sort of, well, wanting to feel that I'm doing something worthwhile with my life. Mum's always done everything for me. I want to do something for myself, stand on my own feet. Yes, I know what you mean, Bert. I want to go and sort of prove myself, show that I can do something. But I don't like leaving Mum to carry on alone. But what else can I do? There's no work to be had round here. Last night I was full of enthusiasm for going away, but now... It's not so easy to go. Mum's always been so good to me, and now this shirt. He's too moved to continue for a moment. Sally, look after Mum for me. Of course I will, Bert. It was all so different last night. I'd only thought of what it was going to be like to be doing something. I hadn't thought about what Mum might feel. I suppose I've always taken her for granted. It's not going to be easy for her, Bert, especially at first. But I'll look after her. But be sure you write often. That will make her feel happier. Oh, I was never much good at writing, said Bert. Never mind. That's something you must do. She'll break her heart if you don't. It's going to be funny away from home, said Bert, looking round the room. I'm so used to this room. The old fireplace... Dad's photograph, the pictures, the old clock, and that candlestick I made at school. Hey, just look at the time. And at that moment, Mrs. Rogers re-entered with a pile of clothing. Here you are, son. I've got your things together. You'll have to get a move on. Here, give us a case. And she begins hurried packing. Bert watches her. Well, the case is just the right size, says Mrs. Rogers. Time to go, said Bert. <laughs> Many months have gone by. Bert has adjusted himself to life at sea. They cross the Atlantic. He wonders at the modern structures of New York and other American coastal cities, loading and unloading cargoes. He revels at the challenges of the life of a sailor. He tastes foods he's never seen in English shops, and he's fascinated by the customs of people of other lands. He is stretched out on his bunk, looking out through the porthole to the heaving sea. Ron enters the cabin. We've been rerouted again, said Ron. What again, said Bert. Where to this time? We're going to Rio. What's the idea? Always everywhere except England. I know, said Ron, it gets you down, doesn't it? But Captain says there's nothing we can do about it. We're on loan to this American company and we've got to collect cargoes wherever they say. What's the Rio run like? asked Bert. Oh, it's a good run, except that it can get pretty hot and steamy sometimes. We'll put in at Balaam on the way. Balaam? Where's that? Oh, it's at the mouth of the Amazon. 
and we'll be bringing back a cargo of nuts. Oh, said Bert, we get rerouted so often I sometimes think we'll never see England again. I'd like to be there now. I bet the daffodils are out now in Richmond Park. Have you ever been to Richmond Park? Not as I remember, said Ron. Oh, that's a lovely place. If I had a thousand pounds, I'd buy a house by the park. And me and Sally would get married. We'd grow our own potatoes and vegetables. We'd have a garden at the front as well as at the back, and apple trees and plum trees. And he picks up his shirt. See this shirt? My mum made it. She stayed up all night doing it, so that I'd leave home decent. Good old mum. This shirt is typical of her. Look at those buttonholes and the shape of the collar. Just as good as you buy in a New York store. But she made it herself, by hand. Nothing shoddy was ever good enough for her. She had to get everything just right. Nothing was too much trouble. Always put your best work into a job, Bert, she used to say. We may be hard up, but we can still be respectable. You can still make people look up to you, however poor you are. You are as rich as your character, and friends are worth all the money in the world. If you play straight and earn the respect of people, life will bring its rewards in good time. That's what Mum was always saying. A good man has nothing to fear. Remember that, Bert, she used to say. No one can do more than his best, and only the best is good enough. She was always saying that. I've been thinking a lot lately, Ron. It's only since I've been away from home that I'm beginning to appreciate what a home is. You sort of take it for granted when you live in it every day. You go out in the morning, you get caught up in what you're doing, you have your mates, you discover new places and learn new things, and you go along and that's your life. But when you're ready, you turn round and you start walking back. Or if you've got the money, you catch a bus or tram, and, and there you are, back in the old street, back to the old door, and the scratches in the brick work that you've got a good hiding for when you were a kid. You hang your coat on the same old hook you've always used, and there are the same old chairs, the same old pictures on the wall, and there's your grub on the table the way you like it cooked, and there's Mum with her apron always there, always turning up trumps. He pauses for a moment. I wonder what she's doing now. And back at home, Mrs. Rogers is answering the door once again. Come in, Sally. I brought you these flowers, said Sally. Oh, you're a dear, said Mrs. Rogers. They're so nice. Let me put them in a vase straight away. And she fetches a vase from the cupboard and arranges the flowers in the window. There, don't they look nice and fresh? They really brighten up the place. Have you heard from Bert yet, asked Sally? No, not a word. But he was never one for writing. When he had his Christmas presents, I used to have to keep on at him to write to thank his relatives, and I had a terrible job to get him to send even a few lines. Not that he was a bad boy, or a thankless boy, just forgetful, that's all. I suppose his mind was always full of other things. He was a good son, really. He used to fetch in the coal for me and didn't mind going out for the shopping. He could put his hand to a bit of housework, too, especially I was having one of my bad turns. I'll see to that, Mum, he would say. I'll go and sweep the stairs or I'll go and do the washing up. And he'd whistle away all the time. He was a good boy, Sally. Being unemployed was getting him down towards the end. He used to sit in that chair over there. 
and brood and that wasn't like him. I suppose he couldn't understand why there was no work anywhere. I suppose it was the idea of not being wanted. Yes, said Sally, I know what you mean. He used to tell me about it. You can hardly credit it, he said once, that we spend all those years at school and we get our school reports that say we're good at this and we're good at that and the teachers say how intelligent we are, how capable and willing to learn and all that. We have all that education to equip us for what? We go along to the labour exchange and nobody wants us. We have nothing to do and people who should know better say we're idle layabouts. It used to make me sick. It must be awful for an enthusiastic young chap who wants to do something with his life not to be able to find work. That's why he's gone to sea. He wants to show people what he's made of. Yes, that's it, Sally, said Mrs. Rogers, that's it. But just think of those hundreds or thousands of others who are unemployed. It's such a wicked waste. The nation's ability going to rot. The war did something to the people. They're not the same now. The country doesn't seem to be able to get itself right somehow. Yes, I know, said Sally, that's what Dad is always saying, but what can anyone do? They can't all leave home. They can't all become sailors. Funny, isn't it? I never thought of Bert being a sailor. I know of one of his favourite phrases was when my ship comes in but he wasn't thinking of being a sailor when he said that it was just a saying just a dream that one day he would make a fortune i remember the day we went on the bus to richmond and we sat by the river and the boats went by but we couldn't even afford a rowing boat never mind sally said one day my ship will come in and i'll be able to give you and mum everything you want and we talked of what we would do if we had a thousand pounds. I wonder what he's doing now, said Mrs. Rogers. I hope he's remembering to wrap up well. You get such cold winds at sea, and he's a bit on the delicate side. Wrap up, I used to tell him. You're much more used to people well than ill, but he would never listen to me. Don't fuss so much, Mum, he used to say. I suppose he thought I was always on at him, but it was for his own good. I always tried to bring him up the right way. And he was a good lad, Sally, he was a good lad. Yes, said Sally, I know, and he was a credit to you. Oh, look, she looked out of the window and saw, there's a postman over the road. That's a change, he's coming over to you. They watched several cards drop through the letterbox. My, my, what a lot, said Mrs. Rogers, just like having a birthday or Christmas time. And she quickly examines them. Yes, they're from Bert, all right. I can tell he's untidy, scrawl a mile off. But fancy sending them all at once. I don't expect he sent them all at once, says Sally. They've probably been held up somewhere. They often do get held up on ships. Yes, just look at the dates. Some of them were posted ages ago. What does he have to say? Oh, said Mrs. Rogers, they all say just about the same. Um, having a good time. Wish you were here. That's about all he ever does write. But he has written, said Sally. Now you'll be able to sleep better, won't you? It's many months later, in Mrs. Rogers' room, colourful travel cards are fixed all round the mirror, and a visitor, Mrs. Johnson, is having tea with Mrs. Rogers. And how is Bert getting on, said Mrs. Johnson. It's years since I've seen him. Oh, fine, said Mrs. Rogers. He went to sea, you know. 
He couldn't bear to be unemployed. It's so much better than staying at home idle. He's certainly seeing the world. He's been to some marvellous places. Just look at all those cards he sent me. This one's from Barbados. That's in the West Indies. And just look at all those bananas growing on the tree. And this one's from Brazil. That's where the nuts come from. And, and this is from Mrs. from Venezuela. Oh, how wonderful. And that's New York, said Mrs. Johnson. I recognise that. Fancy living at the top of one of those skyscrapers. It makes you giddy thinking about it, doesn't it? Oh, yes, said Mrs. Roger, but I don't think I'd like to live in one of them. I expect you miss him, said Mrs. Johnson. I missed him a lot at first. But I'm getting used to his being away now, especially when once I had heard from him. It's nice to feel he remembered, isn't it? He's been away a long time now, though, hasn't he? Oh, yes, says Mrs. Rogers, it is a long time. His ship kept being rerouted, but we expect him home soon. There's a knock at the door and Sally enters. Oh, I'm sorry, said Sally, I didn't know you had company. Oh, this is an old friend, Mrs. Johnson. This is Sally, from across the road. You've often heard me speak of her. Oh, yes, I have. Well, I must be getting along now. Thanks for the cup of tea, Mrs. Rogers. And she leaves. You know, I can recognise, you reckon you'll be welcome at any time. You know that, said Mrs. Rogers as she departed. I just called in to say, said Sally, that I've heard that Bert's ship is due in today. Today? Oh dear, said Mrs. Rogers, I've got nothing in the house except some cold pie. Oh, Bert was always mad about the pie you made. I must get some vegetables done, said Mrs. Rogers, and what shall I do for a sweet? Oh, don't worry, I'll slip out and get something for you, said Sally. I made a jelly last night, you can have that. I'll get you a tin of pears or pineapple or something. Oh, but that's so expensive, said Mrs. Rogers. Ah, but this is a special celebration. Let's splash out for once. And so Sally hurries off to the shops. Mrs. Rogers busies herself about the room, puts a hot water bottle in Bert's bed and hastily dusts his bedroom, and in due course Sally returns with the shopping. Do you know when Bert's ship is expected, asked Mrs. Rogers. No, said Sally, can't be sure. It may be some time yet, or it may already be docked. Depends on the tides. Then there's the cargo to unload. All these things take time. Of course, said Mrs. Rogers, but I wish he'd written to let me know. Well, said Sally, when you're at sea, there's no postman to collect your letters. Oh, no, I hadn't thought of that. Sally is about to leave. Don't go, Sally, said Mrs. Rogers. Wait here with me till he comes. All right, said Sally, I'll just slip across the road to fetch my knitting. Dad won't mind if I leave him for a little while. And she hurries across the road, but is soon back. Mrs. Rogers notices that Sally has changed into a new dress. The hours go by as the two women wait for the arrival of Bert. It is late afternoon when slow footsteps herald the arrival of a visitor. There's a timid knock on the door. I'll go, said Sally, and she opens the door. It's Ron Padwick, and he has a parcel with him. Why, it's a Ron Padwick, said Sally. Afternoon, Mrs. Rogers. Afternoon, Sally, said Ron. Bert asked me to see that you have these. From Bert, said Mrs. Rogers, but why isn't he with you? He was taken sick, Mrs. Rogers, said Ron, with a bad fever. Oh, I knew it, said Mrs. Rogers. I always told him to wrap up more. He sent this letter, said Ron, and he fumbled in his pocket, and he gave an envelope to Sally. He was very sick when he wrote it. Sally hurriedly opens it and reads the message. When my ship comes in, I'll take you to Richmond. What happened, Ron? He just took sick and went into sick bay, and his temperature worse and worse, and there was nothing we could do. Oh, my God, 
says Mrs. Rogers, then he's dead. Oh, no. She collapses into a chair, and Sally does her best to console her. And then after a while, Ron spoke, he, he asked me to give you this. And Mrs. Rogers dazedly opens the parcel to receive the shirt. He never wore it, Mrs. Rogers. He says he wasn't good enough. He thought a wonderful lot of that shirt. He didn't want to wear it out. He wanted to keep it new like you made it for him. He said it would remind him of you as long as he lived. The best mum in the world, he always said. He didn't have a photo of you, so he used to look at the shirt instead and say, Good old mum. She worked her fingers to the bone for me. One day I'm going to do something for her. So long as there are women like her in England, he'd say, it will be a land to be proud of. People like that make it worth going on however tough it is. Sally and Mrs. Rogers sob in each other's arms. Ron, looking uncomfortable, moves to the door. I'm sorry, Mrs. Rogers. I'm proud to have known Bert and the one who made him what he was. And he quietly goes out and shuts the door. Many minutes go by and then Sally suddenly noticed something. There's something in the shirt. And she removes a long envelope. It's that insurance policy. She reads it. So he took out that insurance policy after all. For a thousand pounds. And she looks into the distance. When my ship comes in, I'll take you to Richmond. If I had a thousand pounds, I'd buy you a house by the park. And there will be a front as well as a back garden with apples and pear trees. <laughs>